You're watching the First Baptist Church of Marble Falls, Texas video podcast. To learn more about our church or to listen to an audio-only version of this sermon, please visit us online at fbcmf.org. season in the life uh, of our church, a great uh, time to be alive in this world. Uh, a lot of challenges. Our world is changing very, very quickly, and, uh, and so what a more, there is no more apropos time for us to enter into a season of prayer. But unfortunately, I have never talked or really even thought much about prayer from the perspective we're going to be looking at it this morning. Um, and so I want you to imagine first a, a woman who has a big prayer need. She's down on her knees, and she's praying to God, and she's praying on behalf of somebody that she loves very, very much. It's like a, a prayer triangle. And so first you have the person who is praying at the bottom left point of the triangle, and they pray to God who is on top. And then you have the person being prayed for, the recipient of the prayer, and they're at the bottom right point of the triangle. Now, God does something neat in that he ministers and he reaches out to the heart of both the person praying and the one being prayed for. Now, when we start to uh, think about prayer and start to break it down and, and preach on it as we've been doing, you will have noticed this, that all of the sermons so far have been focused particularly on the requester, the one praying. In the Lord's Prayer, for instance, the disciples say, Lord, teach us how to pray. So teach us how to be on this side of the triangle. Um, most of the time in Sunday school, that's where we're going to be. Most of the sermons, I think every sermon I've ever preached is, is about what we do and about what God does. Um, but something that I haven't considered very often is what happens when we shift this and uh, what it's like to be on the opposite side. What does it feel like to be the one being prayed for? The recipient of prayer, not the one praying. You're going to like this sermon. Um, the one being prayed for, the recipient, I, I think one of the sweetest and best things in all of the Christian life is when somebody that you love and care about comes to you very sincerely and they say, I wanna pray to God for your well-being or something really great for you. Um, I hope that all of you have had the experience at, at least one time that you were able to hear with your ears a grand and, and beautiful and wonderful prayer that somebody prayed over you. Um, that their, their words, their passion, and it was just for you. I hope that you've had that kind of experience. This past week, um, one of our deacons comes into our, my office, and uh, before he leaves, he says, can I pray for you? 
I say, sure. And, and, and y'all, the prayer was really good. It, it was caring. It was thoughtful. Um, the, the, the words were, meant a lot to me, and I think it meant a lot to God, too, because right after that, I, I think that God really heard because he, he reached down, not just for me, but into our, our, our staff. He began to heal. He began to help us in everything, and it really helped me as well. It transformed my day. It transformed my entire week. I was so very thankful for it. Two days later, a church member named um, uh, Sherry Summers came to me, and Sherry is not doing well. Her body is not great, but she comes to me, and uh, she's one of our senior adults, and she says, can I tell you something while I, why I'm okay? And I said, yeah, Sherry. And she said, Brother Ross, I have a great friend. I mean, a really, really good friend, and this lady prays for me all the time. And, and she tells me that she's praying for me, and she calls me, and I hear her prayers. And she said, there is a tangible difference that it makes in my life when I hear her praying for me like that. And I said, Sherry, that makes me so happy. We all need friends like that, don't we? And she said, we sure do. And so later on during the day, I thought about what Sherry said to me, and I, I realized this, that I bet, I imagine that a lot of you here don't have a friend like Sherry. I bet if I asked all, some of you to raise your hand, and I'm not going to ask you to do that, but if you, if you did, um, I bet some of you would say, I, I know that sometimes some people pray for me, but I don't have a friend like that. And I, wouldn't you all love a friend like that, though? Oh, my goodness. It would be awesome. Uh, I wonder how many of you have never received a moment like this. Um, I've been blessed to receive it, and all of the blessings that I have in my life is absolutely nothing that I did for myself. It's not because of any work ethic, and it's not because God made me genetically anything. Um, any good that's in my life ha has happened because of this. Every once in a while, some really godly people, some people who love me, allow me to sit down in a chair, and they'll come and they'll, they'll put their hands on my shoulders and on my head, and, and men as well as women, and they will say, Dear Heavenly Father, please, would you be, be with Ross? Would you help him in this moment? And, and I wonder if any of you have ever felt the privilege of the chair to, to be there. A lot of you have prayed for people. Um, a lot of you have even laid hands on folks and prayed for them, but I, dang, I bet there's a lot of you here who haven't got to be on the other side of that. And, and, and if I were to ask how many of you in your moment of need would love, love to be in the position of the chair and that the whole church could get around and say, oh God, please be with my friend. I love him and I love her. Or please help her through all of this. That you would say, yes, I want it. I, don't embarrass me, but yes, I, I, I want that. And you would. Did y'all know that it's not only important to be in the place of the chair, it's not only important every once in a while, but it is important to be in the place of the chair where people come and they pray for you habitually, all the time. But as important as this is, we don't experience it near as often as we should. And maybe there's a lot of you who have never experienced that. And if you haven't, I have somebody in the Bible who prayed a prayer like that, and he reaches through time and history to lay his hands on you and to pray something very, very special for your life. In this text, we find our Savior praying, and he prays first for himself, and then he prays for um, the disciples. Now, that's very understandable. If y'all were at the Lord's Supper and you were uh, the Last Supper and you were the apostle sitting around that table and Jesus is talking to you and he says, well, let's pray, and everybody bows their head and he says, Heavenly Father, help me. And uh, you'd kind of shake your head, yes, that, that sounds normal. And then, Lord, please help the apostles, all of you sitting right here. Yes, that sounds normal. And, Lord, please help all of these future people that we don't even know yet. And then all of a sudden you start to look at Jesus in the middle of the prayer, thinking, where are you going with this, Jesus? Who are these people that you're praying with now? We don't even know them. Jesus starts to pray for a person in Meadow Lakes and for a person in Marble Falls and for a person living in Horseshoe Bay and Spicewood and all over this area in 2015, all the way out to Round Mountain, all over our world, Christians today, all over the world. John wrote it down. 
Jesus said, my prayer is not only for my disciples, but I pray also for all of those people who will, who would believe in me in the future. That, that's an exciting kind of prayer. It, it's special to us because we don't have to go back and do cultural studies in order to understand this. We don't have to try to figure out the past here because Jesus reaches into the future to talk to us about this. Jesus comes forward and he gives us our prayer. It's for you. It's for me. And uh, the, he did it the night before he was crucified, the night before he was betrayed. And uh, we know that as he goes to the cross, we really were on his mind because the last thing he talked about was us. He talked about us and entering into glory with him. And so I thought about being in the place of prayer, the person being prayed over, the person being prayed for, because I, I just became so happy, y'all, that Jesus prayed for me. Um, I, I've never thought about it before. Have you? That Jesus said a prayer that John recorded, and it's a prayer for you? Uh, that you are the recipient of that? When I hear that people are praying for me, it encourages me in two ways. First, it lets me know that they care for me, which is pretty cool. The second thing, though, that it does is it lets me know that, that God is about to do something supernatural in my life. That when, I'm, when I cannot make it and I'm discouraged supernaturally, not because of my own emotions or I pull myself up by my own bootstraps or somebody comes and just gives me an attaboy or something, I'm able to make it through by something divine and supernatural because of that prayer. It all encourages me. And then, y'all, how remarkable is it going to be when you get to heaven and you realize all of the things that prayer achieved in your life that you don't know right now? It's a mystery to you that when, when you were a teenager and you were out driving and doing things that your mother was at home praying and your father was praying for you and you're okay today. But you don't know that. But we get to heaven, we find out these types of things. It's hard to imagine what all, imagine it, what all has prayer done for you? Only heaven knows. Heaven knows what might have been. The, the truth is what might have been is there's a lot of us in here who could be paralyzed right now from the neck down, couldn't you? It's possible. Um, there's a lot of us who would be dead right now. There's a lot of us who would be addicted right now. There's a lot of us that would be divorced right now. There's a lot of us who would be sick. There's a lot of us who would be oppressed, but we're not. We are not. We're not addicted. We're not divorced. We've made it. We, 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 we're not dead. Most of you are not dead in here. You're okay. And we're not, and it's because maybe the reason that we're not is because somebody prayed for you. They said they would, and then they did. They prayed for you, and God intervened. And the car accident didn't happen. And the, uh, that tempting woman or tempting man way back then, that didn't happen either. You were never tempted in that way. God saved you. He saved you. People prayed for you. And it should give you a great sense of, of hope and, and, and empowerment that people are praying for you. And, and peace and confidence because of that. That, that you're okay because somebody got on their knees, somebody said, Heavenly Father, help so-and-so. Your name has been mentioned before. Um, if your name has never been mentioned or if you have not ever heard your name mentioned in prayer, in, in just a moment, we're getting to the invitation. I, I, I ask this a lot, but let's, let's do this. If you never heard your name mentioned in a prayer, this morning's the morning. Is that Okay. Is that okay? That we can go up to one another for a second. We'll try to end early. And then we're all just going to spend time and have a prayer meeting for a moment. And we're going to say, you can go up to somebody, a friend, and, and if they don't know your name, you can just say, my name is Ross. And, the, and then somebody just says, Heavenly Father, be with Ross. And you hear your name mentioned in that moment. Um, the, I come across stories sometimes, and I don't know exactly where they come from, but uh, the, there's a story about a man 
who was really young named James Stegall, and he was fighting in Vietnam when he was 19 years old, and he said that he had a, a Bible that was a little Gideon Bible that he always kept with him, but he, he really didn't believe in God, and he never, ever prayed. But as the war went on, he began to experience uh, death all around him, and it just petrified him. Um, he says as time went on, he got scared, more nervous and more nervous, and he thought, any day I'm going to die, any day. And so all hope left him, and, uh, and he began to experience absolute dread, and he, and he thought, my, my ticket's going to be punched, today's the day. Well, one morning, he woke up, and, and that feeling was overwhelming to him. This is what he says. He says, on February the 26th, 1968, a very specific day, he woke up in the morning and he said, I was overwhelmed with a sense of dread that I was going to die. Well, later on uh, in the evening, they were attacked and, and, and it was a very brutal attack. And, and he said, this is it. And uh, there was a, a rocket that was coming for him and a friend pushed him into a grease trap and he was in that grease trap and he was just waiting for the explosion to happen and it didn't happen, it malfunctioned somehow, but the attack continued. For five hours, he said that I stayed down in that grease trap, and I thought at any moment people are going to come in and just shoot me from the top. And, uh, and, and he said I was so scared. And then something happened, though, and I reached into my pocket. I pulled out the Bible, and I started reading, and, and I read for hours. And by the time uh, I finished, uh, the Lord gave me a peace that I wasn't going to die that day and that there was hope in my life that I was going to live. And James says, now here's the neat thing. Years and years later, um, I got married and uh, married an old high school sweetheart. And he said, and one day I was over at the, my wife's grandmother's house. And he said, and when I was there, she said, uh, Jimmy, and she called him Jimmy, have I ever told you uh, about a night that I prayed for you? And he said, no. And she said, well, let me tell you. She said, one night, um, I just woke up with this sense of, terror that something bad was going to happen to you and so I started praying for you and she said I prayed all night long she said in the morning time I, I got my Bible and I found a passage of scripture in Matthew chapter um, 18 verse 19 and it said um, uh, where two or more are gathered in my name there will you be also and she said uh, anyone who asks um, here on this earth uh, the God, that God's going to hear that and she said and so I immediately called my Sunday school teacher my Sunday school teacher came over, and we began praying for you on this day. And, uh, and they said, she said, it was like we were wrestling with God like Jacob was doing. And Jacob said, I'm not going to let go of you, God, until you bless me. These two ladies were saying, Lord, we're not going to stop praying until you give us a peace that this young man is okay. And they kept praying and kept praying until finally God comforted their heart that he really was okay. And then she said, oh, let me show you. And she got her Bible, and she brought it to him, and she turned to Matthew 18, 19, and he was reading it, and then he looked over in the margins, and it said, prayed for Jimmy, February 26, 1968. Well, it's the same day that he says that his life was saved. Is it true? I don't have any way of validating it. I don't, I don't know. Um, we, we don't. Uh, but here's why I believe that it's true. Because every day I hear a story where, where God helped somebody because of the prayer of somewhere else. When I read Acts chapter 12, Peter is released from prison very miraculously because the church was praying for him. When you read Acts chapter 20, um, Paul was preaching and uh, he preached into the night and there was a man named Eutychus who falls out of a two-story window and he dies. Paul goes down and he prays for him and God resurrects that young man, Eutychus, right then. He comes back to life. I, I, I believe that that happened with that man because I hear of prayers and how it's transformed so many of you and what prayer has done. We have one um, lady in our church, and when she was a teenager, she had a very, very difficult time as a teenager. It was kind of tough. And, but she's doing great now, successful and doing very, very well. But if you ask her, her testimony is, the reason that I'm doing well right now is because of the prayers of my mother who sat at the foot of my bed, and she prayed for me while I was asleep for hours sometimes. And, you know, 
that that lady grew up she's doing really really well um, married someone who's making a huge difference in, in our church. Why? In there, all of these ramifications, why is our church benefiting from all of this? Could it be because of the prayer of one lady? Could it be because of the prayer of somebody that when you're the recipient of that, that it makes that big of a difference and it has ramifications all over our world like a butterfly's wings? You know the butterfly effect that when if a butterfly flaps his wings on one side of the earth, that it creates a hurricane on the other? That there's something miraculous about it? Y'all, I think that there, there is. So let's say that you have been hitting your head against a wall with something lately and you can't seem to get around it. Has it crossed your mind to ask somebody to pray for you about that? Has it crossed your mind to realize that Jesus Christ prayed for you and that he wants to help you as well. And Jesus asked God for, for three really important things on our behalf. The first thing that he asks for is that we would be united and that we would love one another and be one. Being one, one body. And then that oneness is so compelling to our world that it's easy for us to make disciples because we are one. And then the last thing, that our oneness be glorified in heaven. So those are the three things Jesus prayed for all of us in this text. So first he prayed for unity, our oneness. Y'all, oneness, unity, it, that, that is a movement of love all the time. Love has a way of breaking down all of the barriers that you and I put up in front of one another. If, if anyone here says, I want to be friends with somebody only if they have such and such, um, that, that's a barrier. Love begins to break all that down and bring us together all the time. And, uh, and I'm thankful right now for a season of prayer because it's breaking down things, isn't it, in your lives? It, it's breaking down things in mine. Um, I'm grateful because it's drawing us near to God during a time in our church's life that it's very, very possible that if we were not praying sincerely right now, that, uh, that we would be very frustrated with things. You go through difficult times, and difficult times have a tendency just to beat you up and tear you apart. But when you pray, and when you pray in a united way, when all of us are praying together, difficult times do not tear us down, but it builds us up. We're getting stronger. We're becoming a better church. We're getting more authentic. You are growing in your relationship with God because you're praying while you're experiencing difficulty. When you pray through the difficulty, then what happens in the middle of that suffering is it turns and it transforms into a kind of fellowship with Jesus Christ so that in the end you're able to say, um, I suffer alongside Jesus Christ. He transforms that in prayer. No matter what happens in your life, prayer then builds you up, builds you up, and y'all, it builds us into unity together. This was Paul's main theme. Every book that Paul wrote to all of the, all the letters that he wrote to his churches, it's all about unity. The whole book of Corinthians is all the division that they had in that church. If any of you want to say, we want to be a New Testament church, you're not talking about Corinth or Galatia. Um, these churches were really struggling in the New Testament, and the, the big issue is they had tons of division. And so uh, the church of Philippi, for instance, the apostle Paul prayed for them, and, and he said, and he prayed when he was in prison, and, and Paul said, whatever happens to me, and, and he had just talked about how he could die in prison, how he didn't know exactly what was going to happen, and he said, but whatever happens to me, you, church, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. And then, whether I come and see you or I only hear about you in my absence, I know that you stand firm in one spirit contending, meaning fighting, as one man for the faith and the gospel and not being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Y'all know what helps me be brave and make good decisions and do well? Because we are one. Our church is one. Uh, Paul says this, and he's thinking, I may not get to be with you, but please help my joy com be complete by you being like-minded being one in spirit, contending, fighting for what is right and what is true as one person. It, it sounds almost like a parent who, who's at the end of his life and he calls his children together and this mom or this dad says, kids, I may not be here very long. Please get along with one another. 
please come together and choose to love each other. I don't know, parents. Isn't it one of the most discouraging things in the world when you're a parent and your children don't get along? Oh, I hate it. It's painful. And, and, and there are some parents who deal with the pain that they have a son or a daughter and they have pictures of them at home and how they used to love each other and be close to each other. And now that sibling has not spoken to one another in 20 years. There's no unity in the family. And parents, it's just, it's painful when we see our children be at each other's throats. You, and it doesn't matter, y'all, uh, if you're a parent, your kid could be 50 years old, and you just want to grab him by the neck and say, what's wrong with you? Get along. Love each other. Be, be united. And Jesus prays this for us. And uh, I tell you, the prayer of unity is so doggone powerful that uh, it will change everything. Everything, it, a church that's unified, man, we're able to do anything. It will transform an old, white, racist church when they start to be unified and start to invite other Christians and they start to break down those barriers. An old, white, racist church that's traditional, it will transform them into being a multicultural, multi-generational, multi-racial church. Why? Because Jesus prayed for it. And there's a church in East Texas right now that's experiencing this kind of transformation where all of these things that used to, to keep them distant from one another are all starting to fall apart and they're experiencing revival because they love each other, they know each other, and they're unified with one another. So Jesus prayed for it and he empowers us toward it. And, and y'all keep in mind that what we're talking about is real unity, not counterfeit. Counterfeit unity is called uniformity, and it looks an awful lot like unity, but it's very, very twisted, and it's very different. Uniformity is this. It's when somebody, it's when the emotions uh, begin to take over, and somebody is mad, and they jump up, and they say, y'all know what? Um, if the church decides to do this, uh, I, I'm going to leave it, and I'm going to take everybody who agrees with me. Y'all need to do it this way. This is what we're going to do. So what they're demanding then is uniformity, and it's not what Jesus is talking about here. What Jesus is talking about is that we are united on the most important things while at the same time we are still working out all of those areas where we are different. And we're, we're, we're long-suffering in these types of things. We're working all of these things out, but we are agreed and loving on the most vital essentials of the Christian faith and life. And y'all, when we're united, the next part of Jesus' prayer is that this love that we have for one another begins to be extended out to everybody else. For our church, Kenya feels it. Honduras certainly feels it. Um, uh, Thailand feels it. The Highland Lakes area feels it. They feel the love of the unity that we have in this place. When we do a car care clinic or when we do outreach, what people are experiencing is, wow, this church is unified, and, and, and they love one another, and they love us. Jesus prayed that more people would know him and love him because and through that you and I are unified. It means that our unity has the wonderful purpose of missions and evangelism and the truth that uh, Jesus can help them as well. Y'all, when our friends see us and that we love one another and spend time together, when they see us sticking together, holding one another accountable, it's compelling to the lost world because the lost world offers nothing like this. Nothing. Picture the best team that you've ever been on. The best team that you've ever, ever been on still had people riding the bench who y'all could have done without. <laughs> There's somebody that wasn't competitive enough somebody who wasn't good enough. They were on the team simply because. There was somebody like that. The world has this kind of mentality that if you're not good, if you're not producing, if you're not at the top of your game, then I don't, you know, I, I'm gonna be with people who help me be at my best, not suck all of the life out of me. Um, 
in the Christian church, we're long-suffering with one another no matter what, aren't we? Isn't it great, y'all, to be in a place where you don't have to be at your best? I'm telling you, you don't have to. You could come into this place, and it's okay if you haven't showered on Sunday morning. You can come into this place, and it's okay to be like you are. And when we say that, the rest of the world does not hear that from any other sector. Nowhere. But we have that to offer, that our unity is loving, and other people are, are influenced by it, and it's compelling. And so it's reasonable then that the world is most uninterested in Jesus Christ when the church is most dysfunctional in our unity. When we've messed up unity, no one will want to be a part of our church or Christianity at all. And, and then Jesus goes into the last part of his prayer, and it's that our unity um, builds us toward glory. The last part of Jesus' prayer for us is that all of us who have been brought together and are unified and are one, that in the end, our oneness in the church will lead and flow until into our oneness with Jesus Christ. Uh, listen to how Jesus prays it. He says to God, Father, I want these people that you have given me to be with me where I am, and I want them to see my glory. Y'all, Jesus wants you to see that. You weren't there when he experienced the Mount of Transfiguration. You weren't there to see him raised from the grave. You weren't there through all of these things. We believe on faith. And so Jesus is saying, for all of you who believe in me on faith, I, God, please help those people to see me in all of my glory soon. So y'all, our oneness, the theology is this. Our theology is that Unity among Christians on earth conceive unity with our Savior in heaven. Unity on earth breeds and moves us forward to unity in heaven. If you're not unified here, you're not going to understand heaven. It's going to feel weird. Heaven is a place of unity in the glory of God, and so we're experiencing it right now, moving toward that. And so Jesus ends talking about us getting to be with him in glory, and then he goes to the cross, doesn't he? This is his last teaching. The last thing he talked about was uh, you and me sharing in his glory. And then he dies. But that was his prayer. Do you need prayer today? I don't know what your prayer may specifically be about, but I know that you need it. Could it be that somehow you're struggling with something and there's no end in sight? Could it be that you just haven't asked somebody to pray for you? Maybe you needed to know this morning that, that Jesus prayed for you as well. Um, let's say this. Let's say that you have something you'd love for somebody to pray with you about, but you're just looking for a safe, a safe person. Um, there are safe people all over this place, wonderful people. You have a buddy in here somewhere. You have a friend in here somewhere. And, and uh, so would you find a buddy? We, they could be sitting close to you. And um, uh, would you ask them to pray for something for you? Now, I'll pray for you, and you can come here, and, and I'd love to do it. You can come to the altar. We can just all relax and kind of move around. Find somebody to pray for you. Up in the balcony everywhere, let's just pray together. We have a couple more minutes. And so I'm going to say a prayer. And when I say amen, remember James chapter 5, verse 17, it says, is there anyone here who is sick? Is there anyone here who is burdened? Let him call upon the elders of the church so that the elders may pray for them and anoint them with oil in the name of Jesus Christ. You can pray and have people pray for you as well. Y'all, there are some who have, some of you have never felt the power of that. And you need it. And I need it. So I'm going to pray for us. And, and I know that there are some people who usually stand by the doors and stand over here. You can go to them. But no matter what, when I say amen, everybody just stand, find somebody, and start talking. Okay? All of us praying and talking at the same time.
You've been watching the First Baptist Church of Marble Falls, Texas video podcast. Be sure to check back each and every Monday for new sermons by visiting us online at fbcmf.org.